Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, September 1st. Oh my gosh, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen. It is nearly the final day of our vacation. But it's not a vacation from our commitment to provide you with the best of interviews, interesting topics. Some in the news, some not directly in the news, some relevant to the news. Some that are old, but yet new again, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we have today. It's a fascinating book that was actually written like 20 years ago, right? This book was, was published in 1990. But it has garnered a lot of attention over those years, and, and it's uh, people are bringing up more recently. I, I'm not exactly sure how I stumbled upon it, but it is by Robin uh, Robin Kelly. He is a professor of American history at UCLA, and the book is entitled "Hammer and Ho: Alabama Communists During the Great Depression." Why would that be interesting? Uh, in this day and age. Uh, It is a book about organizing. It is a book about race. It is a book about class. It is a book about identity politics. And um, we talk about the book, the professor and I, we pre-taped this, obviously, because I'm somewhere on vacation. I don't know. Maybe I've left vacation already because I can't take it with my kids. And... Uh, the professor and I also spoke about this moment in time where we have on the left a trying to figure out how to integrate the concepts of identity, uh, particularly issues of race and gender and class. So there's a lot of lessons here. It's a fascinating uh, book and I would Suggest also conversation. Now, folks, it's casual Friday. That's not so casual. And here's what's not going to make it even, this is going to make it even less casual. It's true. Members are going to get something fun afterwards. Some type of uh, super fun thing. For uh, everybody, we're also going to tack on to today's show just because a piece, uh, an interview I did with Marshall Allen of ProPublica, entitled The Myth of Drug Expiration Dates. And it's a uh, largely a myth that is mm, created, nurtured by Big Pharma, because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to throw this stuff out, right? Um... So uh, stick around for that. That is something that originally aired on Ring of Fire Radio. Ring of Fire Radio, of course, is the other uh, show that I do. And you can head over to rofpodcast.com to get the uh, free Ring of Fire show if you want. Also gives you the opportunity to become a member, but, you know, check it out. There's a free um, uh, hour's worth of show over there. Uh, A lot of times I talk to the great Digby on that program. A couple of points Today's show is brought to you by Away. What is Away? It offers high-quality luggage designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel. In fact, right now, I'm quite convinced. I took a car, but it's still it's easier. I mean, I can either put it in a big bag, plastic garbage bag, or I put it in my Away suitcase. It's light. It also has a charge, so I can plug in my phone in there. So when Myla bothers me because she doesn't, I can just have, plug it into the suitcase. Makes a lot of sense. 
It's available in nine colors and four sizes, including carry-on sizes that are compliant with all U.S. major uh, airlines. It has a TSA-approved combination lock, four 360-degree spinner wheels, and if you've never had a, a suitcase with 360-degree uh, spinner wheels, believe me, huge upgrade. <laughs> believe me. It's true. Better yet, both sizes, the carry-on, they are able to charge anything that's powered by USB uh, cord. If you get the full set, they all nest in each other, which is also nice, living in New York. You don't have room for anything. Thanks to a Waze lifetime warranty, if anything breaks, they'll fix it or replace it for you for life. I love mine. I really do. And I do a decent amount of traveling, and I'm very, very particular. Everything has to fit. I have to, I have to pack it the exact same way every time. You document how you pack things? I take pictures. Matt. <laughs> Here's the best. Try out uh, a way for 100 days. Do what you want with it. Travel with it. Instagram it. Doesn't matter. At any point, if you decide it's not for you, return it for a full refund. Shipping's free within the lower 48 states, so you got nothing to lose. For 20 bucks off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash majority. Lowercase, awaytravel.com slash majority all lowercase and then use the promo code majority during checkout that's awaytravel.com slash majority all lowercase promo code majority for twenty dollars off your away suitcase meanwhile i just told you uh, how i pack i'm probably the best dressed i've ever been on this vacation do you know why matt I mean, you can't see me now. What, what could I be wearing? Casual, like casual stuff. But like, I'm going to be out and about and people are like, hey, you dress sort of normal. I mean, when I'm at, I get comments. I get actually uh, positive comments occasionally from when I dress. Not on the show. I dress down for the show. From where then? Bomb fell. Oh, right? I mean, I meant where you get the comments from, but. Oh, so, I mean, nobody. <laughs> I made it up. I actually did get a comment the other day. Someone said I look dapper. Wow, that's very old-fashioned. I was like, what? Are you serious? Are you, mo are you mocking me? And they were like, no, you do. Huh. Now, Matt, uh, I don't know about you. You know I hate shopping for clothes. I hate it. Here's an easier way to get better clothes. Bombfell. It's an online personal styling service that helps men find the right clothes for them. And you, it, they even work with someone like me who is almost like definitively... I lack a style. Unlike other services, there's no fees to work with them. It costs nothing to sign up. It's simple and straightforward. All you have to do is complete a questionnaire, and a dedicated personal stylist will, will handpick uh, pieces specifically for you. You view your selections. You have 48 hours to make any changes or even cancel altogether. Then they send you the stuff. You only pay for the clothes you keep, so if you don't like it, you put it back in the box, you send it back. And you have the option of receiving clothes once every one, two, or three months, so you don't even have to think about it. And once you talk to your personal stylist, they have a sense of what you like. Now, for me, people have a hard time understanding. I don't like, I just don't like clothes. So I went through two stylists. It was a very easy process, though. First, first person, I was like, look, you know what? You've suggested this to me. It doesn't work. They want someone who liked clothes. They want someone who liked clothes. Right. But my second person understood. Like, okay, I get where you come from. And it was good. I was impressed. Best of all, we've negotiated with Bombfeld to get our listeners a special offer of $25 off your first purchase when you go to bombfeld.com slash majority. That's Bombfell, B-O-M-B-E-F-E-L-L. -E Let me do that again. B O M B bomb fell F E L L dot com slash majority. Check it out. And lastly, I almost feel bad doing this Harry's ad because I know I have not shaved in 10 days. But here's the bottom line when I come back from vacation, when I come back from vacation, I'm going to need those sharp blades. I'm going to need those sharp blades because I've got like a, like a three quarter beard, half beard. 
And it used to be, I used to be terrified about it. I used to have to literally go like two different passes. <laughs> but those guys at Harry's, they knew there was only one way to ensure quality, buying their own blade factory. Then how do they get you Harry's quality at less? They sell directly to you over the internet. Their blades are half the price of the normal blades that you see at those, you know, with the in the ice palaces at the uh, the pharmacy. Just two bucks a blade compared to the four bucks or more you'll pay at the drugstore. Harry's is so confident you're gonna love their, their you're gonna love their blades. They're giving you a, a trial set for free. You just cover the shipping. It includes a weighted ergonomic razor handle, a nice one too, smooth. They don't look all like there's some type of like it's not all buffy. I feel like those other razor handles you get at the store, they're all like, like Rambo-y. They look like monster truck accessories. There's something, yeah. Like they need to put all these ridges, and it's weird. You get a five precision engineered blade with lubricating strip and a trimmer blade, so you can get into my nose if you really need to shave my nose. Rich lathering shaving gel and a travel blade cover. It's a thirteen dollar value for you to try. Stop messing around. Get started with Harry's today. Claim your free trial offer. 13 bucks. Just cover the shipping. To get your free trial set, including the razor handle, the five-blade cartridge, the shave gel, go to harrys.com slash majority report right now. That's harrys.com slash majority report. All right, folks, we're going to take a, a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Professor Kelly about Alabama communists during the Great Depression. And then an interview I did with Marshall Allen from ProPublica about the myth of drug expiration dates. And then Matt's going to put in something funny for, uh, for members. Some like, um, you know, a Matt's pick. One of Sam's comedy friends, probably. Yeah, there you go. People I don't even talk to anymore. It's completely because of my anti-Trump stance. <laughs> I'm doing my best, Gavin McGinnis. All right, quick break. Be right back after this. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of History from UCLA, Robin D.G. G. Kelly author of Hammer and Ho, Alabama, Communist During the Great Depression. Welcome to the program, Professor. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So give us a sense of, of in Alabama, where, uh, where, where, where we're talking about here, um, the, the situation for, um, for black workers at this time, and I guess uh, sharecroppers. I mean, give us just set the uh, the table for us then. Right, right. So um, the party really was formed um, in Alabama, or at least arrived in Alabama about 1929, 1930. Uh, so this is right at the beginning of the Great Depression, and it, the idea was to focus on the uh, the industrial sector. So we're talking about Birmingham, Alabama, Bessemer, Alabama. These are places that are part of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company and an extension really of the whole U.S. steel machine. It's like a subsidiary U.S. steel. So the idea was that these are industrial workers. Um, the Communist Party felt like they could reach white workers. In fact, black workers weren't even on the agenda at first because they didn't think they were uh, in a very strong position. Um, but, of course, when they arrived in Birmingham, black workers were the first to, to join up with the party. Uh, while this is happening in the rural areas, particularly what's called the Eastern Piedmont and the Black Belt, these are areas that have um, long histories of, of slavery and cotton production um, uh, where sharecroppers and tenant farmers were literally fighting for their lives. And the party wasn't really prepared at the time to organize sharecroppers and tenant farmers, but they were getting these letters, just loads of letters from farmers who were saying, you know, we're starving. Um, we are supposed to get these uh, advances during the period of fallow times, and the landlords are not giving us our advances. Uh, and so the party had no, no choice but to really investigate. And in investigating, they found a, a ripe, ready 
uh, rural population, I mean, much like the Soviet Union, you know, um, in terms of the peasant communes and the peasant Soviets, uh, right there prepared to, to organize. And some, some of the most militant um, confrontations took place in the Black Belt and in the Eastern Piedmont, um, led by black sharecroppers and tenant farmers. So basically that's it. There was some party presence in northern Alabama, which had a long uh, history of, ironically, kind of white working class and white, white rural organizing around populism and even socialism. But they also were co counties that had very strong um, Klan membership uh, and white supremacy. And so they, they were able to get some support in these counties from former Klansmen um, who joined up, who realized that you know, their biggest enemies weren't black people, but their biggest enemies were the big planters uh, just south of them who, who took up all the best land. Uh, and then finally, they had a, a presence in Montgomery, Alabama, which is the capital. And there was much more uh, intellectuals and a very strong um, uh, Jewish uh, uh, liberal population of, of radicals um, who also joined the party. So, okay, so give us a sense. I mean, I want to I want to get a little more granular with all these sort of different pieces that that are fitting there, but give us a sense of of where the the communist party was in its trajectory by the time it hits Alabama. I mean, Alabama's got to be late in the expansion of the party. Yes? Yes, yes, very late. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, because there was just such broad-based hostility uh, in the South and, and Alabama being, you know, one of the deepest parts of the South. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's a very good question. Now, we have to, to, to answer that question, we have to think internationally. So um, the Communist Party uh, of the USA, like all communist parties around the world, were part of the Communist International, and so a lot of its direction uh, its policies were formulated in Moscow, in the Communist International, which, let me just to be, to be clear on this, the International wasn't just Soviet um, or Russian communists. There were communists from all over the world who came together at these meetings, from South Africa, from Algeria, Egypt, all over Europe, um, Latin America. And so in 1928, the year before, uh, the party actually moved into the South. Two things happened in their policies. One was it's called the third period, where the party actually, the Communist International felt like this is the most radical moment that there's an opportunity for Communist parties to seize power in their nations, including the United States, uh, that, that therefore they had to move towards a much more militant direction, uh, and that is fomenting um, uprisings, you know, direct protest, direct action. That's one thing. The second thing that happened was in the Communist International, uh, a group of mainly black, but not entirely black communists, including South African communists, had come to the conclusion uh, that African Americans in the South have a right to national self-determination. That is, much like the Soviet Union, um, they constituted a nation. And as a nation, an oppressed nation, um, they can either fight for their integration into the U.S. nation or succeed from the Union and form their own nation. And that was a choice. So the, the Communist Party of the USA never bought that line fully. The leadership wasn't crazy about it. But they had no choice because this was the Communist International's position. And so when they went south, they had these sort of two things on the agenda. That is, this is a revolutionary moment, number one, and number two, Black people in the South have a right to self-determination. Um, the irony is that the first communists who went down there, uh, who made contacts, they made contacts with white uh, radicals who had no interest at all in the question of self-determination or the interest of, of the black working class. Um, but once the black working class came forward, you know, the issue of self-determination sort of, it wasn't policy, um, it wasn't a policy-driven, but it was more an ideological or cultural backdrop to uh, black working people reading the communist press, learning about other struggles around the black world, whether it's Africa and the Caribbean, um, identifying themselves as something other than just the working class. And so even though they didn't fight for self-determination, what they did fight for and they did achieve was a sense 
that fighting for black rights isn't distinct from the class struggle. So therefore, in this early period, 1928, now we get to 1929, 30, 31, 1931, something significant happens in Alabama, and that is we know there's a Scottsboro case where nine young men were riding the rails uh, and they are arrested, uh, accused of raping two white women who happen to be on the same train. What basically happened was they got into a fight with a group of, of uh, white workers, white youths, and um, when the police arrested them, they came up. The, they kind of came up with the charge that uh, they had raped these two white women. It turned out to be false. One of the women recanted, but most importantly, their case became a cause celeb around the globe. The Communist Party took up their case. They defended them in court. Uh, at some point, alongside and also in um, uh, in opposition to the NAACP, they um, they made this case uh, one of the principal cases for civil rights in the South. And you know, without going into a lot of details, they won some really significant um, uh, victories in the courts. And more importantly, eventually. Uh, none of them were executed, and they were released at some point. You know, um, that's another story. But the most important thing is that what what the party became by the early 30s was a combination of a kind of civil rights organization for black people and an alternative, or I should say alternative, more like a, a, a catalyst for trade union organizing in the South. And so the other thing that happens in 1934 is there's a strike wave throughout the country, including the South, including places like Birmingham and Bessemer, and the party's sort of at the center of that strike wave. Uh, they help build the CIO um, after 1935. They are really the ones focusing on industrial workers, and they begin to organize in the rural areas as well. Uh, so they become a significant presence in the working class landscape, the industrial landscape, the civil rights landscape. Uh, and in fact, the Communist Party at one point, through its auxiliary called the International Labor Defense, which is the organization that defends the Scottsboro uh, defendants, um, they, the, the ILD and the Communist Party be, are bigger organizations than NAACP in the early 30s. Yeah, and, and this raises, this actually raises another question I wanted to ask of you, which was about sort of the, the competition to organize these people uh, who were there. I mean, because, I mean, I wonder is how much of this was the Communist Party was attractive to both those in the urban centers that they could organize, but particularly the rural people. How much was it that there was something distinct about the fact that there, uh, the, the Communist Party was attractive, and how much was it that nobody else was coming down to try and organize these people. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there are two issues. One is an urban issue. The other one's a rural issue. Um, in the urban areas, there was a history of trade union organizing um, that predates the Communist Party. But keep in mind that these were mostly um, trade unions that discriminated against black people and trade unions that discriminate against the, un the quote, quote, unquote, unskilled industrial workers. So um, the fact of the matter is that there really wasn't an alternative. The NAACP had a presence, but they were not interested in the masses of people, the working class, the poor. Um, there were other organizations that, like civic organizations, uh, uh, religious organizations, Christian organizations, um, that sort of thing that that um, black working people kind of organized themselves, but the party didn't have much competition in this sense. Um, and you know, it also experienced extreme repression. And this is also another factor. I mean, one of the reasons they didn't have much competition is because a lot of organizations just weren't willing to do that work. Um, the number of people who were killed organizing uh, is pretty significant. You know, in other words, we know the civil rights movement uh, itself had a, lo had a lot of casualties, same with the Communist Party from the very beginning. Um, and a lot of people went to jail, prison, uh, were beaten, um, and left for dead, and basically forced into exile. So that was a common, a common practice uh, at the time. Now, in the rural areas, it was a little different, because 
you know, it's not as if the party sent a whole lot of people to organize the rural area. That's actually not true. There was one person, uh, uh, an African-American by the name of Al Murphy, who took it upon himself to be the liaison to organize um, Tallapoosa County and some of the Black Belt counties. But for the most part, um, the people in the rural areas, they became communists or became members of the Short Cropper's Union. They organized themselves. Mm. They didn't, there wasn't an outside force that suddenly came in there with all kinds of knowledge and tactics and tools. What they got were the party newspapers, like the Southern Worker. They got copies of Lenin's What is to be Done. <laughs> they got, you know, and they would read these texts out loud to mostly illiterate and semi-literate sharecroppers. Young girls would read these texts. They'd discuss them. They'd talk about the world. They would put out leaflets in the rural areas, and they were by themselves. So the level of both courage and also the intellectual acuity of people who didn't have a formal education um, is really striking, you know. So the, the fact is what made a difference, and this is why the Communist Party made a difference, what made a difference for them was the recognition that the party that um, – that called on them to organize, the party they reached out to had an international base. Mm -hmm. So for them, and, and I, I kind of document this in the book, um, there were African Americans in the Black Belt who believed that when they went on strike to get a dollar a day for cotton picking, if the planter class came out with violence, they were convinced Stalin would send ships Cross the Atlantic into the Gulf of uh, the Caribbean Bay and basically into Mobile to protect them. So, for them, that's what international solidarity meant. They were part of an international movement, and that gave them a sense of confidence to be able to confront the local sheriff, the uh, deputies, and the, the planter class. Okay, well, I, I, I. So, what happened? Well, I want to ask what happened in those instances when those ships didn't arrive. Uh, but, but, be, but, but before we get to that, um, I was struck by uh, that the, the geographic dynamic of, of, of people living, you know, uh, sharecropping essentially, and they were so spread out on these plots of land that mm -hmm. they could be two or three miles away from people working the same property. In terms of their homes, right. and 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 that and that created, I mean, an obvious challenge. And I wonder, like the the sort of the isolation there, sort of enhanced the um, how much sort of an international solidarity meant to them. Correct. Um, their isolation was important in terms of of sort of relying on international solidarity. At the same time, it was amazing how organized they were already. Because they were, you know, people were organizing through their church groups, through Sunday schools, through gospel quartets, um, and also, like every rural area, there's a market economy where people would go to the city, whether it's Montgomery, um, you know, or, or any other local towns, and they would sell goods, they would trade, they would buy things. So basically, a lot of the raids, the, the initial raids that led to shootouts between sharecroppers and local police were meetings, underground meetings at someone's house, where you'd have maybe 25 or 30 sharecroppers all armed in a secret meeting trying to determine what to do. Uh, and secondly, you know, the, the level of organization allowed for coordinated responses. So when they called for a cotton picking strike in 1935, um, and they they won many of the um, they won many of the plantations, not every single one of them. Um, it was a coordinated effort that was very, very successful all across the Black Belt, all across the Black Belt, um, in some counties more than others. But the fact of the matter is that they were probably as organized as industrial workers. And this shouldn't surprise us because when we look at world history, there's so many examples of peasants you know, and we, we can call them peasants. The Chinese Revolution, the Russian Revolution, um, certainly in Southern Africa, in Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, in West Africa, Angola, and Southern Africa, 
Um, we have, it was a peasant, of, talk about Vietnam, uh, uprisings and levels of organization that won these, um, the, the main battles. Uh, we assume industrial workers are more organized because they're concentrated, their work is socialized, um, they live in close quarters, and, and there's a lot of truth to that. But never underestimate the peasant. <laughs> And so, I mean, what was their perspective? I mean, if they're looking to um, an international, I mean, they're seeing themselves as part of an international movement. What was their perspective on what was going on nationally? I mean, it, it, it's almost as if they, they, they bypass any type of national movement and go from something that's sort of regional, I guess, and fairly local to an international perspective. Right. Well, to be fair, they they were very much aware of what was happening across the United States. Um, When they had an unemployed um, uh, march, this is very early on, 1930, um, there were elements from Alabama who participated in that in uh, 1930. Uh, In 1934, the strike wave I spoke about um, wasn't just the South, it was all across the country, you know, West Coast. San Francisco, um, Midwest. Um, this is when um, uh, the Communist Party were, you know, was really organizing in the industrial sector on the eve of the CIO. And so the workers in Alabama knew all about what was happening. Um, they came out defending um, some of the uh, what they call class war prisoners, you know, across the country, you know, um, in San Francisco and elsewhere, longshoremen. Um, so they knew, but they also knew a little bit about the world. Um, and, and I think that's very, very important. Now, to, to be specific, something happens, uh, and your listeners probably know this story, but in 1935, the Communist International shifts its direction. It shifts many times, 33 and 35. In 1935, uh, they call for a popular front against fascism. And the way that plays out in the South, was uh, de-emphasizing the industrial worker and, and beginning to put emphasis on building alliances with white liberals. Um, in other words, play down, you know, to build sort of black and white unite, bring white liberals into the party, white intellectuals. The problem is that in Alabama, there really are no white liberals. <laughs> right. I mean, they're, they're, you, could, you could count them on one hand in the sense that liberals who are willing to support the party, and I talk about them, you know, um, in the book. There's a handful of really, really militant uh, uh, white people, mostly Jews, like Joseph Gelders and, and his, his um, uh, children. Um, and, you know, there are people who actually don't have much of a link to what's considered the white liberal class in the South, because the white liberal class were segregationists you know, whether they're newspaper editors or whatever, they were all segregationists. They were just segregationists who believed that um, lynching shouldn't take place because the state should do that. You know, the the fundamental difference. Um, So those white intellectuals they're able to draw from into the party were so marginalized that they never really built a popular front as they imagined it. The, The consequence, however was that they, um, they ended up, the, the Communist Party leadership in the South ended up pretty much abandoning um, the black working class and the black poor, and they kind of abandoned the black rural areas uh, as well. Not entirely, but you know, significant reduction in resources and commitment there. And so um, it, I won't say it was the demise of the party. Uh, what happened was a new formation emerged during the popular front, mostly black young intellectuals and black students who formed this, um, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, which was somewhat uh, a kind of precursor to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they were formed about 1937, uh, and they had a base in Alabama, in Birmingham in 1939, um, and eventually were forced out of the city uh, in 48 with the level of violence. Uh, which ultimately led to the demise of the organization. Uh, but but that's, you know, we can always counterfactualize and speculate what could have happened, but that shift from a focus on industrial and rural and working class in the black community 
to trying to build alliances with people who don't want to be in alliance with you. That, I argue, uh, was one of the reasons the party started to decline. So, so did the, the the party shifted away from where it was getting its its energy? Did it did it did it simply then just begin to shrink? I mean, what 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 was that? Yeah. Because internationally, it was focused on a popular front, and it sort of lost the um, the essence of of what was happening to these folks on the ground. That the the emphasis became more international in some ways than than the local issues. Right. Well, well, um, exactly. Except I would just make two two slight um, um, revisions. It's not that the local work became um, that the work became more focused on the international. Is that the international line shifted the local work, so that the local work became more around civil liberties, for example. Um, and, and, I'm, and I don't want to say that the work wasn't important. It was very, very important. It just was different. So they focused on civil liberties. They focused on trying to get more um, liberals to sort of end segregation and form, you know, push for the franchise. Yeah, like the right to vote clubs that emerged. Um, and also, and I forgot to mention this, is the most important thing, um, when the CIO was taking off, the party basically made a choice to subordinate the needs of the CIO to the party. So socialism and these kinds of things were not really on the table anymore. Uh, what was on the table was whatever the CIO needed. But the CIO uh, in the South, the steel workers, uh, mine workers, um, was very, very, very difficult because within the CIO, the leadership was really anti-communist. And so they would use the communists at first, and then they would spit them out, uh, with the exception of a couple of unions. The Mine Mill and Smelter Worker Union was a left union uh, and um, in particular, and they had actually communist leadership in that union. Uh, at the end of World War II, during the Red Scare, those are the unions that were attacked by the NAACP, attacked by the CIO, um, attacked uh, from the right, uh, and they were significantly weakened as a result. So in that sense, these were strategic errors, I think. Uh, but even within those errors, some great accomplishments took place. The Southern Negro Youth Congress really did enormous work, both in rural areas and urban areas, uh, building um, a new sort of anti-racist civil rights constituency, uh, they fought segregation on buses. Uh, they were doing um, popular theater. You know, before there was an Augusta, Augusta Ball, uh, popular theater, sort of people's theater in the rural areas, uh, you know, talking about the, uh, the segregation, talking about sharecropping, talking about capitalism. Um, and they were eventually crushed. Now, the other thing that happened, which I'm sure your listeners know about, was that after um, 1939, um, again, another international event, that is that Stalin um, signed the, uh, the pact with Hitler, uh, non-aggression pact. And for those people who had spent the last four years fighting fascism through the popular front, they felt like it was a real betrayal. Mm. Um, why he did that is a whole complicated story, and I'm not here to defend him on any of that. But the fact is, from 1939 until 1941, when war eventually took place between the Soviet Union and Germany, um, and that pact kind of was wiped out, uh, that was a period where the party lost a lot of its, its sort of committed following, because they felt like, you know, this is a betrayal. Uh, and then in 1941, throughout World War II, the party rebuilt itself uh, in Alabama, but again, around questions of civil rights and civil liberties, um, and really trying to uh, push away from a kind of working class perspective to a broad popular perspective to, to, to dismantle racism in the South. How much of a change was there in the sort of the, the economic situation 
of, and I guess we're, we're talking about, I guess at its peak, there were like 2,000 paid members, but there were thousands more who identified or were involved in the organizing or the training and uh, um, sort of um, n- not necessarily card carrying, I guess, but, um, but, right. but sort of f- uh, maybe ID'd that way. Um, how, how much of a material difference was there in, I mean, how much did, how, how much was the demise of the party a function of material gains that were made at that time? Or was it simply like, this isn't working this way and we're going to first have to deal with uh, civil rights to get more economic benefit? Well, you know, it's, that's a really good question because in, in truth, let me think of it this way. The party itself as a, an autonomous structure uh, began to shrink, in part because its own local initiatives made the party irrelevant. They made themselves irrelevant. Now, that wasn't the intention. But what happened was that, you know, in the CIO, particularly in the, not just the steel workers, but in the mine, mine workers, um, some of the communists, like Henry O. Mayfield and others, became really top-flight trade union organizers. In other words, they did really good work in the trade unions. That became the source of their, their work. Um, Asbury Howard and the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union. Uh, the unions became more the center of party work, and so therefore the party as an autonomous organization uh, wasn't as necessary. Um, the League of Young Southerners, which was like the white version of the Southern Negro Youth Congress and the SMYC, um, all these organizations became so dynamic, though they were run by communists, that the Communist Party itself as an autonomous organization wasn't that important. That's one thing. Um, the second thing that happened uh, was that in order for those organizations to be effective, they couldn't advertise that they were communists. Right, you know, they right. had to play that down. Um, and so their effectiveness, in some ways, depended on that. It wasn't a complete disavowal, because at the same time in 1939-40, uh, Birmingham had a communist bookstore run by Jane Speed, you know, an actual communist bookstore, which is kind of astounding when you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you have trouble finding a communist bookstore in Boston right. at that time. But you could get one in Birmingham. Um, and so in some ways, the very success of the party as a mass, as opening up for mass organizational mass presence, um, meant that it, it was no longer that relevant. Then something happens after the end of World War II, around 1946-47, when um, repression is greater, the Red Scare is at its all-time high, and the National um, uh, Party is actually split. So um, there's so much history I skipped over, but basically um, there's a point in the 40s when Earl Browder, who is the chair of the, the national chairman of the Communist Party, said, you know what, we don't actually need to have a party anymore. We're going to call ourselves the Communist Political Association. Uh, and a lot of parties around the world were sort of moving towards mass work to the point where they said, we don't need a party. Now we are the mass. We, we, we are actually influencing the political culture uh, of the nation in that we could see a Soviet America in the future, and they're very optimistic. Then um, 1944, 45, I can't remember what year exactly, but Jacques Duclos, who's a, a French communist, uh, writes a letter basically condemning the U.S. party and all the others who decided to give up the party, and then they had to sort of turn to the left a dramatic shift where everyone's scrambling to prove how communist they are. And that played itself out uh, in Alabama in detrimental ways. I mean, imagine you, you're you doing this work, you're pretty successful, you're surviving, you're still dealing with repression, and all of a sudden the leadership of your, the national leadership of the organization says, you know what, you need to uh, uh, reconstitute the party and go on the ground. And there's some people who didn't want to do that, others who did. That led to fights and, and disputes, uh, internal disputes in a party that is so small, everyone knew each other, they kind of came up together. 
uh, they were married to each other, you know, right. in terms of the real core, core culture of the party. And they begin to split and break apart and debate. And it just leads to um, what is already a shrinking core into its ultimate demise. Now, what does that mean? Demise, demise is a weird word because demise doesn't mean the people die. Right. <laughs> no. It means the organizational form dies, which gives birth to something actually greater. And that is, uh, and this is at the very end of the book, I don't really say much about it, but it is hard to understand the birth of the civil rights movement as we know it uh, in Birmingham and Bessemer and Montgomery without recognizing the role that communists played in shaping this work. Um, if you take someone as basic as Rosa Parks, you know, and, and her husband, I mean, they both were uh, involved with the Scottsboro case. Uh, Rosa Parks was involved with the NAACP as a leader. Uh, eventually, they knew all these communists. They, they knew Sally Davis, who was Angela Davis's mother, who was best friends with, you know, um, uh, Esther Cooper Jackson, James Jackson. This is this circle, circle of intellectuals, some of whom are official communists, others are just friends of communists, all of them reading Marx and Lenin, uh, and all of them thinking about revolution. And those same people went on to play significant roles, roles in shaping the civil rights movement uh, in Alabama. And so the, the, the legacy they left behind is much greater than the sort of history of the core of the party itself. From, from an organizational, I mean, from training people and from also um, a, a, a creating an ideological framework from which these people to approach their positions in society, I guess. And, correct, correct. So it's like political education. And so let me ask you this. A training standpoint. In terms of, of the New Deal, the New Deal takes place uh, during this time, and there's this sort of, this, I mean, when we talk about agricultural workers and we talk about um, the, you know, uh, the, the women at that time, where, you know, they're in the fields and they're also sort of uh, dealing with... Um, uh, you know, working in, in in people's homes. I mean, these are basically the specific, and not by coincidence, these are people mm -hmm. completely not completely, but very largely left out of of right. a lot of the social insurance program. I mean, how much was that? How much did that drive people? Did did it have an impact? The 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 New Deal itself and the fact that the, they were largely left out uh, of 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 many of the social insurance programs. Well, you know, this is one of the strengths of the party is that they had begun organizing the sectors where the New Deal just ignored them. And of course, they're organizing industrial workers, but you know, rural areas in particular, um, domestic workers. Uh, the party didn't do a very good job organizing domestic uh, workers. But what they did do was that um, they began organizing uh, women who worked on these uh, WPA projects, many of whom were domestic workers who were trying to make a little bit more money by working on these projects, and often you know, construction, road building, that sort of thing. Um, but the most significant factor, I think, is that the New Deal didn't simply ignore um, whole sectors of the working class that the party was interested in. The New Deal helped restructure a sector of the working class. In other words, the New Deal facilitated the dispossession of tenant farmers and sharecroppers from having any access to land and transforming them into a rural proletariat. And this is one of the secret stories that, I mean, I didn't come up with it, but it's, it's a real interesting uh, uh, theme in, in the book, and that is that New Deal agricultural programs, you know, were supposed to benefit the, every, both landlords and tenant farmers and sharecroppers. But what happened was all the benefits were given directly to the landowners. And so they were supposed to distribute that money, but you know, the money that they were getting for not growing cotton, for not growing corn, for not growing, you know, whatever it is that they were told not to grow in order to keep prices down. 
they would get this cash subsidy. And the cash subsidy is supposed to be distributed among uh, sharecroppers, but they wouldn't. They would just keep it. They would keep mm-hmm. the money. And then they would take that money and they would invest in what? Labor saving devices like mechanical cotton um, pickers and that sort of thing. So New Deal federal money helped pay for the transformation of agriculture, which kicked all these people off the land and turned them into rural proletariat. Um, and then for those people who couldn't come back and work for wages, they left. They part of the, the the second migration had a lot to do with people being thrown off the land. Um, so the New Deal was not only ignoring but just damaging and restructuring the whole rural economy. So that played a key role. Now, what does it mean for organizing? Well, what it means is that when the the CIO decided to to make its effort uh, at organizing the rural areas along with the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, which is another organization which has its base in Arkansas, um, groups like uh, you know the United County and Agricultural uh, Workers Ukapawa, they they were now organizing um, wage workers, cotton pickers, um, and people who basically had no access to land, the landless proletariat. So that changed the nature of organizing. They didn't succeed, but that's what that's where the CIO for the first time in any significant way began to try to work in the countryside. Um, that too. And then the, the final thing that happened, and again, I don't want to, I, I don't want to say that there's any single blame, but the CIO um, was a real weak presence. The, the, the CIO did not believe in the South. They did not believe in the South, the national organization. So they launched this thing called Operation Dixie in the post-war period. But they, in, in launching Operation Dixie, they marginalized all the communists, the deep anti-communism. Um, they, uh, they destroyed the communist-led unions, and they never gave the resources that Operation Dixie needed to organize the South. Imagine if they were able to organize the South right after World War II, Right. how different the whole United States would have looked. <laughs> you know? Well, yes. It was a totally uh, different country. Particularly these days. Um, it would, I, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's, the further you come out, almost the, the ripples actually get just sort of bigger. And um, yes. so, all right, so, so, so give me a sense. I mean, just broadly speaking, um, one of the, you know, sort of the challenges on the left now is sort of, is this, this, Perception that there needs to be a balance or there needs to be a a chewing of gum and a walking at the same time and addressing um, uh, uh, people of of color and their unique experience in this country and also a an increased class consciousness. And the the thing that I think comes out of your book is that these are not necessarily separate tracks that they're right. they're in, in, in just speak to that for a moment that the because i mean on some level I mean, it feels like that the that historically like sort of temporally they 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 didn't coexist at the same time uh you know around this time that the that that the the strength of the communist party um got subsumed or transformed into the strength of the civil rights movement is that right? I mean, so, so I mean, speak to that sort of that that relationship, and okay. what and what okay. that era That's tells us question. about that relationship. Right, right. See, I guess my my take is is com- is a complete inversion of the way that we talk about things like the contra- the the tensions between so called identity politics and class. Um, the problem in Alabama and the problem in the South wasn't the failure of uh, black workers who somehow didn't have class consciousness because they're so obsessed with race. No, the problem was white workers who didn't have class consciousness because they're so obsessed with race. Mm. That's, that was the issue because the party tried so hard to organize white workers and they would not come. And they would not come because the story of the communists is that they were nigger lovers, that they basically were, um, you know, coming from a place where they'd have free love, that they were for communism and commune had all these sexual uh, implications, um, and, and that 
the, the, the communists were really the new Yankees coming to the South, trying to redo the Reconstruction, and the white workers are not just have, not having it because white supremacy is what should be the ruling ideology. Meanwhile, black workers like, oh, class struggle? Yeah, we're down for that. <laughs> and they were. And it was black workers, black workers who went to northern Alabama in Klan country and tried to organize white workers. I mean, imagine that. It was black, the, 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 the courage of black workers to say, you know what, you need to be with us. But the identity politics of, of white supremacy was such that they bought into this idea that any of those alliances would undermine their own self-interest, when in fact, it's the alliance across race, the alliance with the class that would benefit them. So in the end, every single time the party starts to sort of build, something would happen in which you know, white workers um, would abandon them would leave them, right. would criticize them, would attack them. Um, and so when we get to the civil rights movement and the sort of legacy of the party, I mean, and I've made this argument before, um, almost all the positions that were taken, whether it's talking about the Alabama, um, um, uh, you know, c- civil rights movement, you know, um, the, the, you talk about SNCC, Right. You're talking about the March in Washington. You're talking about CORE. They all had a class dimension. In other words, they were pushing for jobs. They were pushing to end um, racial barriers to job advancement, uh, raising wages, housing issues. In other words, these are class issues. I mean, the Civil Rights Movement had actually held on to class issues throughout the 60s. But that's not the story we get. The story we get is that somehow the Civil Rights Movement abandoned class in part because they were anti-communists. And it's true. There, there were people in the civil rights movement who were very anti-communists because they thought they'd lose um, support. Uh, but there were communists within that uh, movement who were hidden. Uh, people like Jack O'Dell. Well, to, you know, to a large extent, who, it, I mean, to a large extent, it's, it seems like we still have that same problem, <laughs> right? Where uh, yeah. white working class, um, they're the ones who can't, who, I mean, I mean, it, it, it seems, you know, the debate today, or at least, you know, sort of is that um, those uh, I'm hesitant to say the Democratic Party, but but uh, of the, <laughs> the, the debate on the left is that mm-hmm. we need to put aside a certain amount of identity politics to reach out to what working white class uh, uh, to white working class workers. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me the dynamic is still sort of the, pro- the same problem that. Well, that's all well right. and good, but the people who are not putting it aside are the white working class. <laughs> I mean, lar- you know, right, right. largely speaking, that they're still seeing uh, black people and uh, maybe women, I, I don't know, uh, you know, coming and wanting part of, uh, you know, whatever they had or they, you know, think they deserve. And the solidarity is much tougher coming from that direction. I mean, and, and right. so... There's not necessarily a a, a a a a solution to come from this era, is there, or or, or is there? Well, see, I think there is a solution. That is to go back and look at the history. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. I've been making this argument for 25 years, um, and I'm not the only one who makes it. But I've been making this argument for 25 years, and that is that identity politics politics is the problem, but it's white identity politics. It's not every white person, because clearly one of the, the great things about the party and the story that, that I'm, I'm able to tell in this book is that there were white people who came forward, who joined the party, who risked their lives, who were beaten for the class. But the class includes the right not to have... The, class struggle includes um, the struggle against state violence that directs at particularly racialized groups. That's class struggle. The right to have justice in courts. You know, the right to make sure that race is not used to keep all wages down. I mean, these are the things that are class struggles. They're class struggles because the class doesn't look like just white people. In other words, when, when those white 
radicals, those white militants, realized that. They began to fight tooth and nail for both civil rights and justice issues, women's issues, you know, because the women question was always on the table in a certain kind of way. Um, uh, equality of, of, of wages, um, the right to have electricity, which is oftentimes an issue of social reproduction, that is the ability of households to function. I mean, these were class struggles. The, the end of racial segregation in housing and schools and these sorts of things, which actually undermined the whole class. And so as long as we have white identity politics, we'll never have a strong left movement. And so the Communist Party story in Alabama is exactly that story. It's that um, it's, you know, each time the party is building up you know, real, real power, white supremacy is, is the, the Achilles heel that cuts it, that cuts it. Because when Bull Connor in 1948 was waging war, this is the last battle of the Communist Party in, in, this, in Alabama, waging war in the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Where were the white workers to defend them? They were nowhere to be found. They were, they were supporting Bull Connor. Hmm. You know? And here you got an organization that full of black and white youth who are saying, we can no longer have a society where people don't get a living wage. We can no longer have a society where people are being killed by the police with malcompunction. We can no longer have a society where men and women are treated unequally. They're saying all this stuff. They're saying it. They're, they're, this is their agenda. And Bokana comes out there and he's like, no, you all are going to jail. And they had no one to defend them. Nobody. Because they were reds and they were black people. The combination is lethal. And all the white people were just nothing but like nigger lovers who sleep with black men, you know, and they're reds. That's all you need to do. Throw those words out there and people will jump just like, you know, Pavlov's dog, mm. you know? So that is, that is the problem. And that's why I think the, even though the book is 25 years old, I go back and look at it. It's like, you know, we're, we're still here. <laughs> I was going to say, we it's not here. just a question of, of learning from history on some level. It's uh, we're just, uh, we're still living it. Yes. <laughs> The book is Hammer and Ho, yeah. Alabama Communist During the Great Depression. Uh, Professor uh, Robin D.G. Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate so, it. So, Marshall, uh, last we spoke, uh, I don't know, about a month or so ago, we were uh, you were telling us the, uh, the story, which is one of the ongoing sort of threads, I guess, ProPublica is pulling on why we have some of the most expensive health care, or uh, some of the most, the most expensive health care, per capita, and I guess in real dollars probably as well, uh, of anywhere else in the industrialized uh, world. And uh, last time you we were on, you were talking about the, the, I guess, the wastefulness and really in some ways the profiteering involved in the simple combination of two drugs readily available, putting them together into one drug and then charging exorbitant fees um, because to a certain extent, there's a, a certain amount of playing on the uh, ignorance of the public and probably even those who dispense of the medicine in some respects. And this time around, uh, you have tackled what you call the myth of drug expiration dates. And I got to tell you, this, I, the, this has been an ongoing debate in my household, um, and I never now make the mistake although I may start again, of going to like a Costco and buying a big uh, thing of Advil and then finding out like a year or two later, I got to throw it away because we haven't gone through half of it and, it, and it's expired. Um, but you dug into this. Yeah, so I dug into it. And um, like you said, Sam, it is one of the great, I think, domestic debates going on all over the country. You know, you have people who uh, look at the expiration date on a pill bottle. And as soon as it crosses that particular date, they take the thing and they throw it in the trash. And then you have people who are more laid back types who see something that's years past its expiration date and still take it and say that they're just fine. And so 
Um, I got interested in this story because I was contacted by a pharmacist at a hospital in Boston, and he told me that he doubts the expiration dates on all the drugs that he has to throw away. And of course, you know, hospitals are much more strict than we are in our consumer medicine cabinets, right? There's no law that tells us that we are not allowed to take uh, expired medicine. But in hospitals or medical facilities around the country, they have very strict laws and regulations that say that they must throw away anything that's past its expiration date. And so I went up to Boston and visited this um, pharmacist. His name is David Berkowitz. He's at Newton Wellesley Hospital just outside Boston. And he showed me he has a shelf in his pharmacy. You know, it's probably, you know, it's like one of these floor to ceiling shelves that you might have in your garage or in your uh, storage room or something. And it was filled with bins of all different types of drugs that had passed their expiration dates. You know, there was a big box of EpiPens, there was atropine, there's sodium bicarbonate, all these different drugs that he has to pull off of his shelves and manage his inventory and just toss in the trash. And he said that in his hospital alone, he throws away about $200,000 a year worth of expired drugs. And if wow. you were to calculate that across the hospitals nationwide, you're looking at about $800 million in drugs being thrown away just in hospital pharmacies. That's extraordinary, and I, and I guess maybe um, this is we're a little late, but better late than never in pointing out that the biggest problem that we have within our health insurance, uh, I guess, delivery and uh, access, the biggest driver of cost of our health insurance is not contrary to I think what people think is a function of health insurance but rather just simply the cost of our medicine for whatever reason, and one of these apparently is this, uh, is just that much more expensive um, than, well, than others. Like, and, like, like you ahead. had alluded to earlier, everything in this country is more expensive when it comes to health care. We pay about twice as much uh, than any other country in the world in terms of developed countries for health care, more per capita, than any other country in the world by about two times. And this whole project I've been doing is looking at why these costs are so high. And experts estimate that we are wasting about $765 billion a year. That's a billion with a B. And all that money, that's about 25% of the total healthcare spend every year. You know, this is one of the biggest parts of our economy, and we are throwing away hundreds of billions of dollars. And so I've been trying to document as many cases as I can where we're needlessly throwing things away with the, with the hope that if somebody were to make some changes, if some, if some leaders um, took the initiative to address some of these problems, we wouldn't have to have the big debate that we're having in Washington, D.C. right now over um, coverage and over insurance and over Obamacare. All they're talking about in D.C. right now is how to cover all these people but the reason it's such a challenge is because it is so expensive. And what they're not debating is the underlying cost and why things are so expensive. To a certain extent, even, and I happen to be a single payer um, uh, supporter, but even the single payer, when we talk about single payer in terms of as a, as a cost containment, not in terms of its universality, but in terms of cost containment, is a bank shot, right? Because the the value of having a single payer in terms of cost containment is, and obviously there's some there's some savings in terms of the administrative costs and the the, the lack of profit, because uh, the government's not looking for a profit on the health insurance. But the the single biggest element of that in terms of a cost containment is that you have theoretically one entity that has the data that can say things like, that can basically negotiate and say, hey, uh, we have the data to establish that this procedure or that procedure is not, um, is not uh, medically necessary or is not cost effective, or uh, that we can see, we need to see certain reductions in your, let's say, I don't know, prescription drug waste uh, right, to, right. To, to push this forward. It's really, yeah. so it's all sort we, of second order have, stuff. 
But, right. We have a very fragmented system, you know, and there's no accountability. Um, there's no one keeping track of this. So even when it comes to something like how many drugs are thrown away because they're expired, no one's actually tracking that um, in an aggregate way to say across the country how much is being thrown away. The drug companies, I think they are tracking it, but they don't they won't tell me. I mean, they don't make this information public. They wouldn't tell me when I asked them. And back to the expiration dates, the thing that's most surprising to me is that no one is actually checking to see how long the drugs actually last. And so every drug is different. So when they've tested drugs, they have now found wait a that- I, Before we get to this part, because I, 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 yeah. I want to um, uh, I, I want to get into th- this element about it, because I think there is an assumption by everyone that they look on a bottle and they see an expiration date. They don't want to take it after that date because it may harm them in some fashion. And there is some assumption, I think, that we make when we see that printed on a bottle and we presume that it's mandated that expiration date is printed on the bottle, that it's there for a very specific reason. And it turns out that reason may ultimately be just about the profits of the drug companies. (laughs) Well, we got to take a quick think, break. Yeah, I don't well, think it's a hold, I don't think it's a dumb Mark, reason to assume that they expire because you know the term expire means that something is bad. And it's actually not an accurate term to put on those bottles because all, all right, we're going to take a break, Marshall. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we will address that very question. We got to right. take a quick break. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 